Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 95. It's great to have you with us. Um, thanks for um, taking time out to listen to this stuff. You know, it's, it's not an easy job, that job that you have to do listening to this. So I wanted to begin by talking about um, something you may have um, seen float by online, and that is a, an increasing concern and a legitimate increasing concern about uh, what are called deep fake videos, deep fake videos. And, uh, and the concern, the concern is, um, well, what a deep fake video is, is the technology, technology is getting to the point where you can, um, uh, get some, some politician, let's say, um, on camera with his voice, his gestures, his face, everything saying things that are reprehensible or, um, you know, total gaffes or career-ending, uh, career-ending comments, and uh, the concern is: let's say you have a hot, um, a very close and very hot political campaign, and a week before the election, a someone claims to have found unrevealed footage of, you know, the the bad politician, and it's a deep fake video manufactured for the occasion, and you release it. Uh, the damage is done, the, the election was close to begin with, and all intelligent observers believe that the, the release of the deep fake video at the last minute uh, is what uh, swung the election the way it went. And then the, fa- the forgery is discovered a week after the election. So the, pr- the problem is, now what? Now, that really is a problem in... in um, when you're talking about elections, that really is a, a, a big problem. But I would say there's an even bigger problem when we're talking about um, uh, criminal uh, trials, criminal uh, cases. And, uh, and this is building up to um, my proposal, and I'd like to, I'd like to suggest this periodically uh, until somebody important hears about it and introduces the a, a bill to address this. I believe that we're rapidly getting to the point where we ought not to uh, accept any kind of electronic evidence against someone in a court of law without the burden of proof with regard to that evidence being shifted. So uh, let's say um, you have a bank's surveillance cameras showing, you know, an inept bank robber sticking uh, sticking up the bank, and he's a clumsy bank robber, and so his mask falls off halfway through the robbery, and it's a great shot, and you get you, yeah, th- this is you know Henry Schwartz is the guy, he's the one who robbed the bank. Well, if that had happened um, thirty years ago, uh, it would make sense to introduce the video surveillance uh, to the tape as evidence in the trial. But we're getting to the point where, um, it, given the capacity of uh, deep fake videos, we're getting to the point where I would want anybody who introduces video ed- evidence or audio evidence or electronic evidence or computer uh, records um, to demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt that those that, that evidence was not manufactured for the trial, was not cooked for the trial. Um, you don't you don't really want people being put away. Um, it, it, it seems to me that when you're using electronic uh, evidence and you ship off somebody's hard drive and they and it comes back with all this you know damning you know child porn on it, well, <sighs> How do we know that it wasn't put on his computer at the lab? How, what sort of safeguards are there? How do we know that this um, surveillance footage wasn't tinkered with? How do we know that it wasn't? It's not a deep fake video. I think we need to uh, start being a lot more cynical, a lot more dubious about uh, about the. Uh, evidentiary value of such things. So, deep fa- deep, deep fake videos in the law, just, just keep it in mind. Start, start becoming a little more 
cynical. So now to our book review uh, section um, for episode 95 of the podcast. Last time for ep- in episode 94, I, I talked a little bit about uh, the story of Lou Zamperini's life in the book Unbroken. And I said I was going to uh, do this with a couple of books where there was a personal connection to our family. Um, my dad was a friend of Lou Zamperini's and uh, got to know him in Japan when Zamperini had gone over there to um, find the guards uh, that had, had had responsibility for him during the war in order to share the gospel with them, in order to witness to them. Uh, this book is a book that many of you are familiar with. You might have it around your house, but it's The Hiding Place by uh, Corrie ten Boom. Uh, she was from the same generation, the same era. She was a woman in a Dutch family that uh, resisted the Nazis, that was involved in uh, hiding uh, Jews from uh, from the N- Nazi uh, uh, persecution of the Jews. And she and her sister, Betsy, were uh, arrested and put in a concentration camp. And, and the hiding place is Cory Ten Boom's um, story. Now, she's she wrote some other uh, books, A Tramp for the Lord and uh, A Prisoner and Yet and some other books. But her most notable book, her famous book, and a book that was uh, like Unbroken, a book that was made into a movie, was The Hiding Place. Now, um, uh, the this is a um, the the personal connection is that when when my folks got married in Japan, um, uh, Corey Ten Boom had also had had become uh, friends with my mom. My mom was a missionary in Japan, so my dad's friends with Lou Zamperini and my mom's friends with Corey Ten Boom. And, but you have to understand that being friends with Corey Ten Boom back in those days, she was a great woman, but she was not yet a famous woman. Um, her, her book had not yet uh, hit it big and so on. But she was traveling, speaking um, uh, as, as an evangelist and doing that kind of work. Uh, she, at one point, uh, Corey Ten Boom asked my mom, be, before my mom was uh, married, obviously, asked my mom if she would be her traveling companion, but my mom was otherwise occupied. And uh, as it happened, Corey Ten Boom accompanied my parents on the la- latter part of their honeymoon as they traveled together in um, in Japan. Well, uh, one of my favorite uh, stories relates to not the hiding place, but to one of um, Corey Ten Boom's um, uh, other books, A Prisoner and Yet. When I, Annapolis is my hometown, and it's the town where I, I did most of my growing up. And my parents, my dad, brought Corey Ten Boom to Annapolis to uh, to speak. And uh, and I remember um, uh, Corey Ten Boom giving me uh, a wiffle ball as a present, and uh, I was in the front yard when she gave it to me. And I and I uh, I honestly acknowledge that that wiffle ball is something I should have kept better track of, and I should have had her sign, and I should have had somebody take a picture of her giving me the wiffle ball so I could establish these things. But that's one of my claims to fame. Corey Ten Boom gave me a wiffle ball, which I subsequently lost playing with it, no doubt. Um, Well, uh, my uh, father had given uh, a woman in the neighborhood, uh, a Jewish woman, he had given her a copy of one of Corey's books, uh, A Prisoner and Yet. And this woman uh, read the book and really appreciated it. And then when she found out that Corey Ten Boom was going to be coming to Annapolis, she got uh, all whipped up and just was really excited about Corey Ten Boom coming and asked uh, if, if it would be possible for Corey Ten Boom to speak at her synagogue. And this was, um, this was not a liberal synagogue either. It was uh, um, on the conservative end of, um, uh, of Judaism. And so my dad said, okay. And, and so uh, my dad took Corey to the synagogue for her to speak. And I, I heard my dad tell this story because he said it's, it, it's basically he was using it as an evidence. Of how, do, how can you tell when someone is filled with the Spirit? 
and he, they're filled with the Spirit, he said, when they testify to Jesus Christ, when, when their hearts and minds and mouths are full of Jesus Christ. And he used that as an illustration because he said he was sitting there in the synagogue listening to Corrie ten Boom uh, tell her story, and he was thinking something like, if she says the Lord Jesus Christ one more time, we're not going to make it out of here. <laughs> but she was well received because she was obviously uh, full of the Spirit and full of love for the people she was speaking to. So, uh, the hiding place is a is a story of how faithful Christians who are not um, not big name people who are just being faithful in their corner are when they be if if and when they become famous after the fact, as Corey Ten Boom did, uh, that uh, we should recognize that there are thousands of instances of such heroism that never made it into a book, that never made it into uh, a movie, but, w- but which will be revealed at the last day. Um, the Lord says that you know, a cup of cold water is not going to pass unnoticed at the last day. So this is not to take anything away from the heroic measures that the Ten Boom family engaged in to protect Jews from uh, the Nazis and, you know, risking their own lives. Sir Corey Ten Boom's father uh, was taken off and he d- he died in the concentration camp. When that, um, w- with that recognition, this is not to take anything away from um those acts of heroism, which we subsequently recognize. We just need to understand that the kingdom of God advances with those invisible acts of faithfulness all over the world in obscure corners. So we're continuing with podcast episode 95, and this is our Hamartiology. This is our Hamarti. Hamarti. Excuse me, our Hamartiology section. Anopheles means unprofitable. Anopheles, unprofitable. It's used twice in the New Testament, both times in a moral sense. It's not talking about a, a small business that was unprofitable. It's talking about uh, something that is morally unprofitable. The first instance is this, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. That's in Titus 3, 9. In other words, these wrangles, these janglings about stupid questions are, are things, it's an unprofitable exercise and it's unprofitable at just the point where it ought to have been profitable. Uh, unprofitable where it ought to have been profitable. Stupid wrangles sown produce a harvest to match. When you have stupid wrangles, you produce the same kind of stupid, stupid wrangle harvest. The second usage does not refer to sin, but it does refer to the inability of the older covenant to put us right with God once for all. In that sense, Hebrews 7.18 tells us the older covenant was unprofitable. So there's a moral sense to it, but it's not a sinful sense. It's not, we're not saying that the Old Covenant was immoral or morally faulty in any way, but it, it didn't bring home the bacon. It didn't get the job done. God don't He's God. You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.